All right. Plants are pretty. Plants as ornamentals. Plants as things that we pretty much just look at, not growing them for food purposes. We ask a lot of our plants. We've talked a lot in the last few weeks about that. And one of those things that we ask them to be is simply pretty. Simply something for us to look at. We, we like looking at pretty things. We utilize them in rituals such as weddings or Easter. We utilize them in public gardens where the only reason for those plants to be there is for other people to show up and look at them. We like looking at flowers. We like smelling flowers. We create hobbies out of them. Succulents are kind of the big thing right now. So um, if you were to go to a lot of different places, you'll find lots and lots of different succulents. It's fantastic that people might grow a plant and not know anything about it, learn how to grow it. They might have fun with it. They might have fun propagating it. In the last year, particularly once when we went into lockdown, people started growing more and more plants. So it was interesting to see how some of these things that have been kind of ignored relatively recently are now starting to make a comeback and people are really enjoying them for no other reason than they're fun. So we see different garden styles. We see people visiting public gardens. And in the upper right, I found that online and I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, somebody had glued little succulents to their fingernails. I don't know how practical it is, but it's kind of fun. So we're seeing all so sorts of new uses for plants. The challenge, of course, and that always, this has always been a problem, it's, this is nothing new, uh, is over collecting of wild plants. So people going out into the woods and finding our, wild, our native wild orchids and picking them, uh, plants being poached from other countries and shipped around the world, um, basically being smuggled from other countries just because people want them for part of their collection. And as an example of that, I got the opportunity to visit the Smithsonian and go behind the scenes with them a few years ago. And this is one, two of several greenhouses dedicated to plants that have been caught at the border being trying to be smuggled in. And international law says that we need to keep these plants alive until such time as the country might want them back. Of course, many of these countries don't have the money for these sorts of things, but we're required to keep them. This is just two of many greenhouses that they had full of all kinds of different plants um, that people were trying to smuggle into the country. There's lots of benefits. I'm sure anybody who cares for any plant other than for food purposes can come up with a list of reasons why they do those things. These are some of the things that we can, we can learn about. Um, if nothing else, if it makes you smile, is it worth it to you? So there's tons and tons of reasons why people might benefit from caring for plants. Sometimes people will go out of their way to alter their environment or their yard or their property or their home simply to help care for plants, creating a little greenhouse to grow things that they might not otherwise be able to grow, creating a shade hut for, for properties that really don't have a whole lot of shade so they can grow things that they, could, they can't grow otherwise creating above ground or in ground modifications to the soil, to the climate, so that we can grow things or grow things longer that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to grow. Some people will create very specialized systems for their plants. Uh, some plants require deionized water, some plants require distilled water, some plants require very specialized lighting and or heating systems, especially if we're gonna grow them by seed. So people will construct these things just to care for their plants. People who get into hobby plants sometimes also get into uh, propagating those plants, either via cuttings or via grafting. A lot of times they're propagating plants and those plants are never ever going to see the inside of a sales nursery. People are doing it just for fun. This is an example of grafting. Grafting is where you take the top of one plant, usually in woody plants, and you stick it to the rootstock of another plant. Sometimes they are different species. Usually they are very closely related species, so a maple to a maple, those, those sorts of things. Um, and this allows us to grow plants that might not have good rooting systems, plants that when they're young might not have good roots. It sometimes allows us to change and alter the properties of plants. So if we look at the plant on the left, that's a pin oak. And you'll notice how the lower branches kind of dip down. On the right side picture, you'll have the very left plant on the right picture is a normal pin oak and you can see how the branches dip down. But uh, the right one is also a pin oak and the lower branches go down less. That was one where we propagated it and bred it not to have those lower branches, but it needed to be grafted onto the regular rootstock because it couldn't grow its own roots. 
Sometimes these things cause problems. Most of our crab apples are grafted onto a rootstock of crab apple, and those roots often sucker, so that creates a maintenance issue for, for folks. Occasionally, like we have on the right, we get something kind of amusing, and this is a weeping graft. So to get our weeping plants, we graft those onto a regular trunk, and then the branches dip down. Weeping plants can't, can't sense gravity, so that's why they're always going down. But the rootstock broke bud, and sent a branch going up because it's not a weeping form. So horticulturally interesting from an ornamental perspective, not exactly the prettiest thing in the world. You can find lots of pictures like this online. This is a photoshopped version of a plant that had 40 different species grafted onto it while it's in flower. So this is, this is a photoshopped version. This is the actual plant. And the drawing on the right hand side, I found that online too, and that is the original creator of this plant, his drawing of where and how he wanted things grafted onto the trunk. So all of these are very closely aligned. You've got apples and pears and peaches and plums, and those are all very closely related plants that he grafted onto one, one trunk. There's no reason for this except that I thought it was a cool picture. We do a lot of things with our ornamental plants. We ask them to be good lawns where we can have recreation on them. We ask them to have, be in our parks where we can walk by and just have the beauty of nature. But it's also a booming industry. There are more jobs in the landscape industry than we know what to do with at this point. We're looking at about 100,000 worker labor shortage. That's just the landscape portion of things. The greenhouse industry is the same way. The turf industry is the same way. So we're, we're looking at a labor shortage that's um, immense. We might ask our ornamental plants to do erosion control, where you might need even specified netting to hold the plants in place until they get themselves established. Can you imagine a sports field without grass? Yes, obviously we can, because many of our professional leagues are playing on artificial turf, but most of our tiny humans are playing on actual turf. Imagine playing in the mud. You can't do it. It's going to be on grass. I'm not going to click through to these things, but basically, if you were to, if you were to click through, what you'll find is arguments for why lawns are bad because of pesticides, because of monoculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, if you click through to the other one, it's arguments as why lawns are good: uh, carbon sequestration, um, photosynthesis, erosion control. It's kind of up to you to make your own argument. So if you are of the opinion that pesticide usage is, and monoculture is bad, then you would be of the, of the type that would want to reduce the lawn as much as you possibly can. If you are of the opinion that these plants are sequestering carbon and they're producing oxygen and they are beautiful, then you might think lawn is a good thing. It's kind of personal preference at that point. So I'm not here to sway you one way or the other. It's just to kind of tell you that there are pros and cons on both sides of this of this particular argument. We, we walk through parks because they have plants. We want to be in nature as human beings. Even if the nature is as constructed as a golf course, there are very few quote unquote natural landscapes that are as constructed as a golf course and yet as an industry that's a booming industry and golf courses have a beauty of their own. Most of what we hear as bedding plants, those are usually our annuals, our tender perennials, things that we're buying every year, putting in our gardens for their flowering. Uh, perennials, they live longer than three years. So our trees, our shrubs, hostas, daylilies, things, things of that nature. Um, and when we're dealing with our ornamental plants, we have the opportunity to grow a lot more variety of things than those of you who are predominantly dealing with agronomic settings, where most of our crop plants, not all of them, but most of our crop plants are annuals and they're planted every year. If you're in an ornamental setting, you want a mix of things. So we go to garden centers and we drool over things, those of us who are plant geeks. You know, we look for something different and weird and new and we want combinations of trees and shrubs and annuals and perennials and all sorts of different things. We want the fall color and the flowering and the fruiting and we know that if we have nice landscaping it can increase the property value of our house. We can create specialized gardens. We can do gardens for pollinators. We can do gardens that might help endangered species or birds or insects or things in our, in our neighborhoods. 
We can grow weird and unusual gardens, xeriscape gardens, or gardens with limited usage. Now, for us, a xeriscape garden isn't going to look like this, this image here, which was taken out in California. So I shot that at California in the Huntington Gardens. But uh, we might look at prairie plants and our native woodland plants, which are used to Ohio climates. Replacing the hell strip with plants something that can be done now some some cities have ordinances against this uh, some cities have ordinance and zoning zoning laws that require a tree in the hell strip worcester for example is one of those is one of those areas so worcester requires a tree and lawn in the in the hell strip or the tree lawn um, and so this is not allowed here but this is one possibility that might help reduce mowing might help reduce the turf area if one was of the opinion that turf was bad gardens are beautiful is it a valid reason to grow plants just because they're pretty just because even if they're not producing food for us if they just make you smile well here's something that you're probably not going to see very often and this is the roof of the ford plant and they have turned it into a garden this garden actually has practical purposes and that is to slow the water that in any rain, those plants are going to absorb a lot of the water and then send that back into the atmosphere. And that water doesn't get into the sewer system overflowing our sewer system. So there's actually a practical purpose to these, to these green roofs. What about specialty gardens? Is it people put a pond in their property, a small water feature so they can collect the new type of plant? We like those sorts of things. Water tends to be calming. We like the sound of water flowing over waterfalls and things like that. We like the fact that it might attract wildlife. Well, some people like that. Others might not. We might grow butterfly and hummingbird gardens. Get to see some unusual creatures. Help with pollination. You always hear save the pollinator, save the pollinators. Well, planting plants for bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, other insects is a valid reason to grow plants. Anybody grow any house plants? Sometimes they have flowers on them. Sometimes they're grown more for their foliage. Indoors is a very difficult environment for plants. It's much darker and much drier. Plants tend to like it much brighter than that. Even our shaded areas are much brighter than our houses are. So sometimes we have to create specialty environments for them. I've started to see this in the last few years. Plants grown as temporary art. And when, they're out, when they outgrow this location, they either toss them, throw them on a compost pile, um, cut them back, put them outside so they can kind of recover and do something else with them. Art on a wall. These are plants grown on walls. This is the latest, latest thing in the last few years is, is this vertical guarding. And we're taking that to an extreme sometimes with, with buildings. Yes, we are seeing plants being grown on buildings. All different kinds of environments for plants. Is this a booming business? Yes. Is that a valid reason to do it? Maybe. Is it something that people might look at? Can you visualize this image without the plants? And what does that do to your thoughts of this particular building? So ask yourself, do plants, do something pretty make me smile? And is that a valid reason to grow plants? Okay, as always, if you have questions, don't hesitate to get in touch.